You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to a special episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. This episode is in partnership with Ascend, the largest pan-Asian business professional membership organization in North America. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series, and joining me today as co-host is Anna Mock. Anna is the partner at Deloitte and co-founder and president of Ascend. We're also fortunate at the Conference Board to have Anna as one of our trustees. Anna, welcome to the program. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be here. In today's conversation, we will discuss pathways to becoming a CEO. How did gender, race, and personality change that pathway? and what mindset is needed to reach this goal. I'm so glad that joining us in today's conversation is Deb Liu, CEO of Ancestry. Welcome, Deb. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Now let's get right into the questions. Deb, what is your pathway to becoming a CEO? Share with us how you got there and if you think that was a traditional pathway. You know, it's funny. I never anticipated I would become a CEO. Actually, I remember a friend of mine who is now herself a CEO said to me many years ago, she said, you know, someday we were, we were grousing about something at work. I had gone to her office to complain. And she said, you know, someday we're going to be CEOs. And I just thought that was the craziest thing. And I remember telling her what, you know, why would you think that? You know, today she's a the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, Instacart. And, you know, for her, it was inevitable. It was something that she knew this is what she wanted. And for me, it was a much different path, even though we ended up in the same place. A lot of it had to do with the fact that it, someone like me would never be a CEO, at least in my own mind. And I think that was one of the biggest limitations for me was that it didn't look like what a normal CEO would look like. And so therefore I couldn't achieve it. And I think that as a result, It's a reminder that, you know, sometimes what you, if you can't see something, you can't envision yourself achieving it. And I had to learn the hard way that, you know, this path wasn't easy and it wasn't something that was really obvious at all. And yeah, building on that, Deb, on the pathway front, how different or do you think it's been for you because you are female and identify as female? You know, I think part of that is, you know, there, if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, you know, women are now, um, you know, st- making headway, but it's still really early days, right? I still think that we are not anywhere close. If you think about it, women earn more than 50% of the of the college degrees, but you look at as you head up into the C-suite and then eventually to boards and to CEOs, you know, they are vastly underrepresented. And then beyond being a woman, obviously as an Asian American woman, it is even more underrepresented. It's something that, you know, Ascend has studied for a long time. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, it's it's not one thing, it's a thousand things. You know, it's, it's the fact that women drop out of the workforce at a much greater rate, that they feel stuck, that they, you know, even the first rung of the ladder, becoming a manager, you know, for every hundred men that become a manager, something like 80 something women actually become managers. And so they're getting stuck all along the way. And so I think that as a woman who, who has achieved this, you know, there's so many things that that um, that get in the way and are challenging. And I hope that as we look to the future, we can take out some of those stumbling blocks, some of those detours and help more women achieve this, this goal. Do you feel being one of the few uh, women of color CEOs and few Asian women CEOs that you've been able to help redefine the role of the CEO, back to your earlier comment about so few, right, that um, looked like you as you were building your career. You know, I remember um, I went to a CEO conference last year, and it was like 200, 250 people there. And I looked around, and I was the only woman of color in the entire room. In fact, I think there were maybe, it was less than 10% women in the room, and I was the only woman of color. And I just remember thinking, I don't belong here. And then I said, you know what, but I'm here, which means that next year there's going to be another and another and another, you know, we can look at this problem in two ways. One is that, you know, very few 
there are very few Asian women CEOs, or we can say, you know what, once there's one, there can be two, there can be three. We can show that we can achieve the same level of success that we can deliver to our shareholders, to our customers the same way. And so rather than looking at it as I don't belong, I have really reframed the question to say, I need to do a really great job so that the next time there's an opportunity that they look at someone like me and say, yes, she can do it too. Mm -hmm. Debbie and I have spoken a bit about belonging, right? And about creating a place for others to feel belong. I know you've given this a lot of thought. What are some of the examples of how um, you feel you've been successful in helping others create that sense of belonging? I think, you know, a lot of times we talk about diversity and inclusion. It's really about opening the door. It's not about what it feels like when you're inside when you're in that room and you look different than everybody else. And I think sometimes to say, well, you know, you're already there, but at the same time, if we are really thinking about what that experience is like for everybody who enters that room, we're really not, not focusing on belonging and also retention in, in the spaces that we're talking about. And so one of the things I really think about is, you know, belonging doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in a room with everyone who looks like you. It means are, you know, are we celebrating differences? Are we talking about things openly? Are we, you know, inclusive in how we talk about the, the language that we use, the way that we build our products. I think belonging isn't just one thing where everybody has to look like you, but it's really about, are we celebrating who we are and making it a point to say, you know, I see you and I see who you are. And I see that you are a member of our community as well. Hey, we talk a lot about allyship, right? And that word sometimes is daunting because it feels like we have to be all things to all people, but creating belonging starts with being good allies. And I know you've done that quite a bit in your career. So I wanted just to take a moment to thank you for that, because I know your work is not only supporting women and those of Asian descent, but really all great leaders. Um, and creating pathways, you know, I'd like to dig a little bit more, Deb, into how really you know, as business leaders that are listening to this podcast largely, how do we create more pathways for women and also other communities of color? I think first is having great allies. You know, one thing you talked about was allies. I actually wrote a book and published it last year. One of the chapters was about how allies can really be transformative to your career. And I talk about mentors and sponsors. I'm only here because I've had incredible mentors and sponsors throughout the years, people who opened doors for me. And very few of them look like me. And, but they were people who said, you know what, I see something in you and I believe in you. And here's how I'm going to open the door for you to take that next step. That is so powerful as somebody who, who felt, you know, really alienated. I grew up in a small town in the South that where very few people look like me and, you know, having people say, you know what, I don't know what your experience is, but I see you and I want to open that door for you is so incredibly powerful. And I think that we can all be allies. We, we can't experience what other people experience, but we can say, hey, you know what? I see potential in you. This is a stretch opportunity I want to give you. I want to, I want to open this door for you. And so I think all of us can be great allies, even if it's for people who, who aren't like us. I think sometimes we think it has to be about representation. It has to be, you have to be paired off with somebody who's, who's just like you. But instead, a lot of it has to do with people who say, I just want to give you the opportunity to do something great because I know that you're, you have a lot of potential. That is so empowering to anybody who, you know, spent their life feeling like they were, you know, maybe alienated or not seen. And so that's something which I want to pay forward in my own career. And I hope that all of us can do that, regardless of where we come from. You don't have to understand the experience to say, I can open up doors for you. And I think what you're touching on is we need to have others open the door for us and really pull us in. And um, that is important. But what about us opening our own doors. I know one of the questions you received, especially from women when you became uh, the CEO of Ancestry was them asking, what am I doing wrong? Can you share some of those conversations and what those qu questions led you to reflect on? You know, I wish that there was a silver bullet and I could, you know, there was an unlock, but instead I, I, ask, I ask each woman, think about the future you. What does the future you wish you were doing today to get, get you to where she is. So five years from now, what do you want to achieve? And who do you want to be? And what are you doing today to further that? And so many times when I frame it that way, a lot of women are like, oh, I know I could do these three things. You know, I said, for example, if you're not asking enough, 
and you're not hearing no enough, then you need to ask more. You know, do you have a sponsor? Are you actively seeking a sponsor? Or are you waiting for one to come to you? Are you, you know, if you have this dream of someday maybe starting a company or reaching the C-suite, what are you doing today to get you closer to that goal? I think sometimes we kind of hope that someone recognizes our brilliance and, and sponsors us, and that's great. And for some people, we, they've been fortunate. But, you know, I, I also think that we have so much autonomy and so much ownership over our own future. And it's not the people who are the luckiest or the people who have the most privilege, it's the people who take what they have. And yes, absolutely, some people have more you know, support and some people have, have different um, opportunities, but at the same time, it's the people who take the reins and say, you know what, I'm gonna ask for what I want. I'm gonna seek out opportunities where I'm gonna get support from my manager. I am going to do these stretch assignments, even if it's really hard for me. I'm gonna to learn to speak up, even if I'm an introvert. I think so many of those things are really about us changing ourselves. You know, the environment is going to be the environment. We can't change that overnight. I wish we I had some magic wand to say that, you know, everything is fair, but it's not. And so a lot of my book, actually, the themes of Take Back Your Power is just, we can't change, you know, we don't have a magic wand. We can't change things overnight. But what are the steps that we can take to actually further our own careers, to further each other, to help one another, and actually change and bend the arc of, of the work that we do towards, you know, more fairness and more opportunity for everyone. Yeah, I think you're touching on this concept of really reframing our mindset, right? Advancement and really reaching our potential is as much about our own self mindset. Uh, I know sometimes it's very lonely because we're part of perhaps a smaller group in the executive leadership ranks. What are some things you've done as techniques to really help you reframe your mindset and make sure you're not feeling so lonely at the top, so to speak? Well, one is, do you have a circle of people that you trust? You know, do you have a group of people that, that you can, you can, you know, bounce ideas off of? One of the things that I love, I've had, I've been a part of multiple lean in circles, you know, and I'm friends with those people to this day. And I think those are the kinds of circles, people who carry you through the difficult times. And I think that one of the things that we forget is that sometimes we feel like we have to go it alone. And that's absolutely not true. Do you have a circle of people who, who you can lean on? And if you don't, how do you build that? I think that sometimes, you know, especially when you reach a certain level, people say, well, it's really lonely. Why does it have to be lonely? Why can't you travel together? And so I think reframing that mindset and saying, you know, what is it that I don't have and how can I get there? How do I create a circle of people I can trust? How do I create my own personal board of directors, for example? How do I have a team where I can trust them to share vulnerably? and openly. And if you don't have those things, what are the steps it takes to achieve that? I think that once you achieve it, you will see that it opens up so much more possibility. It gives you an opportunity to really think through your problems in a way that you never imagined before. Thank you for those comments, Deb. I know you've been pretty public about being an introvert or identifying as an introvert. Share with the audience of how it feels like and how you lead as one. You know, um, one of the things I always imagined as a CEO is that they're extremely extroverted, can get up on stage and rally the troops and get people excited. And that's not me. You know, I grew up, as I said, in a small town in the South, and I just learned that being quiet was a protector. It was a, a wall that I built up and that, you know, I went to engineering school and, you know, you didn't have to say anything. You could get good grades and and then it stopped working. At some point in my career, I realized it stopped working for me and I had to figure out another path. Part of it is culturally, you know, you don't want to stand out too much as an Asian American. Part of it, my parents were like, well, you'll put your head down and get the work done, right? I, I'm sure a lot of people have heard that. And so as an introvert, I found it really hard to lead because I didn't have the loudest voice. I didn't have all the ideas. I was really shy to speak up and that was really hard. And yet at the same time, I realized that that's what people were hungering for. They weren't hungering for somebody to tell them what to do. They were hungering for connection. They were hungering for people who are willing to, to open themselves up and vulnerability, something that I really, really struggled with. And so I've really turned it on its head. You know, how do you lead as an introvert? I'm actually, you know, how do we bring more voices to the table? I don't have to lead every meeting, but I can set up the environment so that introverts and extroverts can come to the table and have richer discussions. 
you know, I, I actually wrote this article called The Secret Bias No One Talks About. And that secret bias is that we have this huge bias towards people who are willing to speak up on any topic on any at any moment. And we ignore that bias. We we promote people who are willing to put their ideas out there. But what if you're missing half of the great ideas in the world because you're missing half of the voices in the room? And so for me, it's really creating structural change in the way we lead meetings. For example, one thing we do is we have an agenda ahead of time. I ask people to read, we have pre-reads for everything. We go around a circle. Whenever we have opinions, I actually go around a circle. You know, for people who feel uncomfortable speaking on the spot, I will actually do voting ahead of time where people put in their ideas and they actually have to rate things from one to 10 ahead of time. So that, you know, you're actually getting the best ideas on the table and you're able to, to hear everything. And so leading as an introvert means I lead really differently. I don't have popcorn conversations in my, in my leadership team. Instead, we try to structure it so that every voice is heard equally. And, you know, I learned that that can be a superpower too, that I can see the world where I was the one sitting back for many years, not bringing up my ideas and what that cost the company and myself. And so now I work really hard to make sure that every voice is heard. Deb, how do you recharge yourself given you are an introvert and are always with people in your role as CEO? You know, I think one of the things that we think is, you know, so I, I don't know if any of you read the book uh, Quiet by Susan Cain, but I love that book because it speaks to so much of what I'm talking about is, is introverts. And, you know, the world is built for extroverts. And so, so much of what we can do is how do you recharge your batteries? You know, when I'm present, I am 110% present. But then when I go home, one of the things that I do is I write a lot because I use writing as a way to process. Some people process by talking. I actually process by writing. And so for me, it is a chance for me to actually kind of unpack the day by writing something, you know, writing my reflections on the day, writing an article, something to just help me empty my mind and actually find peace. And so I, I make a cup of jasmine green tea at the very end of the day, and I, I just allow myself to write for half an hour. And sometimes it's brilliant, and a lot of times it's terrible, and I'll never see the light of day. But it is just so powerful to have those rituals where you can find and decompress you know, at the end of the day in peace. So in your case, I'm hearing writing, rituals, using that quiet time to recharge, but making sure you have that time to do that has been one of your um, one of your rechargers. So thank you for sharing that. Let's switch a little bit and talk about ancestry. Five billion dollar company that's really changing the way people talk about their family history and stories to themselves and the public. How has your work with the company really changed the way in which you talk about your family? Yeah, you know, what attracted me to Ancestry is, you know, the the rich history that each of us have as our family. And I am so close to my family, even though I grew up in a place really far away from my family, my parents made it a really huge effort to ensure that we visited, you know, they would save up for years so we could afford to go visit their families in Asia. You know, at the same time, they they went out of their way to teach us those family traditions. And you know, for me, it's really capturing the stories and carrying them on for future generations. That's so important, which is why I was attracted to working at Ancestry and Leading because I see so much of what we are is actually, you know, the makeup of our family history. You know, the choices our parents made, you know, 50, 60 years ago affect us every single day. You know, my parents and my in-laws came to America a place that they had never been, they didn't know anything about other than, you know, and, and rarely knew anybody. And they landed in a country that they, and they built an entire life here. And they never knew if they could go home until they made enough money, you know? And so that story is so powerful. And it's something which, you know, recently as part of um, the holidays, my children actually interviewed my, you know, my mother-in-law and my mother and actually captured that story so that they could post it in on Ancestry so they can write a story about their grandparents. And I think that that is that connection carries them forward as well, because this is a story of resilience and the story of, of their love for this country and, and how much how proud they are of their grandchildren here. And so, you know, as as I um, embark on my, my second year, the, actually the start of my third year here at Ancestry, I think it's really change, you know, really helping people capture that story. But then also, how do you talk about it? How do you connect over those things? I think sometimes you know, it's easy just to look forward, but forget that we are so much made up of the history that we've been and all the places our ancestors have been that brought us to where we are today. Talk a little bit more, because some of the people in the audience may not know the full uh, complement of what Ancestry offers. 
take a minute and share a bit more because you mentioned your your daughter uh, recording the the history with your in-laws. Um, I'd love to learn more about how to really use ancestry to capture uh, my family's history. Yeah, you know, ancestry is a place where you can build your family tree and then you can actually talk, talk about the stories of how people ended up in the places they did, how they met each other and, and married and and that rich history, you can share photos and stories. And so much of that is, is in a shoebox in so many people's homes. You know, those photos and, and stories are things that we hide in some closet and we forget about. And then when people have passed, we, we lose out on that history. And so ancestry is a place where people can document their family history, but also can discover it. You know, you might not know, um, you know, the, the details of how your ancestors came to America and, you know, such an opportunity. We have public records from, from all different places, ship manifests, where you can actually see the landing ports and, and the, the immigration documents and draft cards. And so much of that are things that are lost. And so we, we bring together uh, public archives, we scan you know, private archives, and we bring it together and actually make it available to our subscribers. So you can build your family history, you can capture those stories and learn more about what made you who you are today. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm looking forward to learning more and actually capturing my family history in a more uh, thoughtful way. I know we're right coming up on time. So let me ask you a final question. And let's really looking at this year, 2023. What are you look most looking forward to? I think the biggest thing is, you know, as we come out of COVID and as we look to the future, there's been, you know, if I had told you in 2019 that the next three years were going to happen, I think nobody would have believed us. And so, you know, but people are really resilient and just seeing them, you know, go through a time when we've, we've struggled so much with so many different things and yet so much have so much hope for the future. I think that this year, it will be a year when we when we look to the future again, when we're not kind of just hunkered down, but we actually see the opportunities that are ahead. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, and I'm optimistic about the future and I'm optimistic that we will bounce back as a community and that, you know, this will be an opportunity for us to look to the next 10, 20 years and the innovation that is to come. Great, thank you, Deb. Deb, thanks for joining us today. And Anna, thanks so much for co-hosting. Great to be with you, both Steve and Deb. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues. I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Vodlin, and this podcast has been brought to you in partnership with Ascend by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation for over 100 years. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side. Just visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.